think about the profound influence of the Bible on the world, the way that it has shaped our culture, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, it's probably a good idea that you know at least what it says. It's going to be about us taking and reading the Bible. Welcome back to the Take and Read Podcast. Pastor Chad here. Wanted to bring to you this week a special episode. I uh, recently preached a sermon that I think is appropriate to the the goal here at the Take and Read Podcast. And we looked in Titus chapter 2 at sound doctrine and the role that it plays in the life of a believer. And so uh, hopefully it's encouraging to you uh, if... Uh, if you want to listen to more sermons, uh, you can go to easthaven.org. You can check out uh, all of the sermons there and the archives there and uh, come and, and listen to the, our team of, of preachers, uh, and hopefully you're encouraged. But this particular episode, I think, is pertinent to what we do here at the Take and Read podcast, so uh, hopefully you are encouraged to go take and read the Word of God. Blessings. Good morning. Welcome uh, to East Haven Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Chad, one of the pastors here, and it is, it's an honor to be with you this morning and to partake in God's Word. You know, we sang that song, There's Another in the Fire. That's such a powerful lyric. You think about where that, what that references. It goes back to the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. There's this recounting of when God's people were exiled under the ruler Nebuchadnezzar. And he had erected a a statue of himself in order for all of his subjects to worship. And so you just think about the epitome of idolatry and false worship and just an affront to the God of the universe. And so these, these young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, resisted and said, we're not going to. In fact, they were accused by others of resisting, and it was so distinctly obvious that they would not engage in false worship that what happened? They're put in a furnace. And and Nebuchadnezzar came to him and said, if you don't worship and fall down at this statue and worship, I'm going to put you in a big old furnace, and I'm going to burn you alive. And he said, who, where's your God that he could possibly deliver you from me? That he could possibly cause you to escape? (laughs) And they're like, well, here's the deal. We're not gonna worship you. And we're not gonna worship your, your statue. And our God will deliver us even if you put us in the fire. And he's like, all right, we'll see. And there was another in the fire with them when he looked in and he saw that they weren't being consumed. And yet there was a fourth person. Who was that? It was Jesus Christ. And so when we sing that lyric, there's great power in that truth. And there are people in this room today that are in an incredibly hard place, whether it's because of sickness, finances, personal relational struggle, or you're facing persecution because of your faith, you're in a fire. And that truth says that there's another one that stands with you. Praise be to God in Christ Jesus. And so as we get ready to, that's not even the sermon, by the way. That was just, that was a lyric from a song, which was just powerful. So let's pray and let's attend to God's word. Father, I thank you for your word to us this morning. I thank you for the truth that we can sing and we can express and we can rejoice in that Jesus Christ Your son, the living God, took on flesh, dwelt among us, and that we get to know him. And that you are a God that speaks and is present just as much as you were in that furnace. You are present here today and you speak through your word. And I pray that we would be responsive and receptive to your word as we gather as your people, as your bride. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. You know, you think about the the distinction, the obvious distinction that must have existed for those men to be called out. They They were 
obviously different. And they wouldn't, and it wasn't just in the nature of their worship, but there's probably a lot about them that was distinct from the rest of the Babylonian culture to the point that they were so distinct that they needed to be rid of and they tried to get rid of them. You know, and it's, when you think about when Jesus establishes his church, right? The, the disciples are there and they are talking with him and they're asking him, is this when you're gonna restore the kingdom to the Israelites? Is this now? Is it, is it gonna happen? And he says, it's, the time is not for you to know, but here's what you can know, that you will be my witnesses and the spirit's gonna come in power and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so what does it mean to be the witnesses? What does it mean to be his people? Well, that goes all the way back when, when Peter first realized, and that wasn't a realization of his own doing, but God revealed it to him that Jesus was in fact the Christ. You go back to when he first confesses and Jesus asks him, who do you say that I am? And he says, you're, you're the Christ. You are the son of God. And Jesus says, you're right. And man didn't reveal that to you. God revealed that to you. And it's on that rock, right? The confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, on that confession, I will build my church. And when he says, I will build my church, he uses this interesting word, church. Like it's very normal to us. Yeah, church, that's, that's, what, that's what we do, right? We go to church, no, we don't. We are the church, right? But he uses this word, and the word itself, ekklesia in the Greek, is a compound word. It's two words, ek, meaning out of, and kaleo, called ones. So he says, on this rock, the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, I will build out a called out people that will be called out. What does that mean? It means they're distinct They're not like every other people group. They're called out, they're separated, they're different, obviously different. And it's based on the fact that they have confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that changes everything. That is what causes them to be distinct. And when you think about that very message and everything that it's had to go through to get to you, think about it. The confession that Peter made that day was a real time and space event in history. He makes this confession and that moves forward. And then they're given the instruction, go make disciples. So they go, they go make other confessors of that very reality throughout. 30 years later, it arrives in Crete and Paul writes a letter to Titus about what he's supposed to do to this group of people that have made that same confession. And then you think about everything it's had to go through to get to you all of the nuances of war and famine and genocide, torture, political stop, all these types of things that have tried to disrupt this message. And one day, you heard it. You were told by some faithful person, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Jesus of Nazareth physically lived, physically died, and rose again, and he is God incarnate. You heard that message. Maybe today's the day you're hearing it. Praise be to God. But for those who've already heard it, think about when you heard it. Did it cause a distinction in your life? Upon hearing that truth and accepting it, were you then a distinct person, distinct from others that had not received or responded to that message. I'm ashamed to say that I did not. I was not distinct in any way. When I first heard the message of Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, I prayed a prayer. I said the words that I thought I was supposed to say and then continued to live my life exactly how I had before. There was no distinction. And I am ashamed of that. Because the distinction didn't come until two years later when I encountered Jesus. I didn't just pray the prayer, I encountered Jesus. And that had such a profound effect on me that it changed things. I couldn't go on living the way that I had because everything was different. And the distinction here is I went from being somebody who knew about God 
to knowing God. And that's a huge, huge difference. That's the difference that Paul has articulated here in Titus. What Pastor Matt brought us through at the end of chapter one was this idea that there's these qualifications for these men who are overseer, elders, shepherds, pastors. But there had been others in their community that were claiming to be these types of people, but were doing far different things. In fact, it describes them as as upsetting whole families, teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. And then the ultimate kind of condemning statement is in verse 16 of chapter one. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. That was me. When that gospel message arrived to me, initially, I moved as somebody who professed to know him, but denied him with my works. That may be some in this room today. So we then arrive at chapter two. And we will read it. So if you want to open up to Titus chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 10 in this next part in our series. You can either look on the screen or open in your copy of God's word. Starting in verse 1, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. All right, well, let's walk through this. First of all, he says, but as for you, right? This indication that there's a contrast between the way that Titus should lead and teach that's different from the way that these others that claim to know God but deny him by his work. So there needs to be a difference. And so he describes the kind of teaching that Titus is to do He calls it sound doctrine. It's an interesting phrase, and sometimes we'll we'll kind of turn off at that point and go, okay, that that sounds like theology or really heady stuff. But sound doctrine is simply healthy teaching or healthy instruction. Instruction that would lead one to health. Because the teaching and instruction that was coming from these other false teachers was a kind of teaching that was leading to oppression and ultimately death, spiritual death. And so the kind of teaching that Titus was to engage in was to result in vibrancy in the people that were learning it. It was the teaching about Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel. That was to describe the nature of his teaching. And it was to be evidence that this is good teaching because it would produce good living healthy living. Notice that the false teachers, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. So this kind of teaching should result in a kind of living. And that's going to be the the litmus test of this teaching. Okay. Another way to think about it would be this. We're in this series and we've got all these kind of cool adventure, you know, rafts and kayaks and backpack. So I should use a a cool outdoor adventure analogy. So I'll try it. Okay. Think about this. Sound doctrine would be similar to guidelines. And I don't mean like rules and regulations as guidelines, but the technical term 
when you're doing alpine mountaineering is you will often have guides that go out beforehand and determine the route that one should take in order not to fall into a hole in the snow and fall to your death or to cause an avalanche. There are all kinds of things on either side. So there's a particular route that one can take that will allow them to successfully summit. And so these fixed rope systems are called guidelines. And so you click in and you're able to follow this very particular route. The sound doctrine that Paul is encouraging Titus to teach is simply the guidelines that Jesus Christ, the one true guide, has charted. And we're to live according to that path. Okay? How'd I do? Was that good? I mean, good. We, guidelines, adventure, outdoor, thrive. Okay, we did it. Good. So, sound doctrine results and guides us into a worthy life. There's multiple times where Paul will say, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Sound doctrine is what teaches us to do that, to walk in a manner worthy that's consistent with Christ and that causes a distinction from the culture. So let's unpack these. First of all, you have five groups represented that he addresses. You got older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and bond servants. And you can self-select which group of, whether you're an older man or a younger man, an older woman, a younger I'm not here to tell you which one you are. But he covers his bases. He doesn't leave anyone out. He's addressing all facets of this newfound community that has been shaped by the confession that Jesus is the Christ. He's talking about this church. So, Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Sober-mindedness, well, that refers to one who's characterized by a life of moderation and stability. Dignified, this refers to somebody who is worthy of respect, not someone who demands it, but is worthy of it. They're self-controlled, meaning they're disciplined and they're not driven by passion or flesh. In fact, this one, self-control, appears and is a part of every group that's mentioned here. It's the one through line that you see with all of these groups is self-control. And that's an important thing to recognize, as we'll see. Also, men, older men are to be sound in faith. Sound means what? Healthy. So they're to have a healthy faith healthy, life-giving love, and steadfastness. That means they're steady, they're obedient, and they're consistent. This is what is to describe the way of older men in the community. Older women, reverent in behavior. Reverence means holy or faithful to the Lord. Not slanderers means they're careful in the ways they speak about others who are not in their presence. Careful about the way that they speak about others not in their presence. Not slaves to wine. Well, that implies self-control. They're not enslaved to any kind of substance, but they have not been driven by passions, but are exercising self-control in that regard. They teach what is good and train young women. The focus of their teaching is probably newlyweds. In the, if you look in the context of the instruction here, so let's look at younger women are to love their husbands and children. That means they're devoted to their family rather than being devoted to themselves or outside of their family. But their devotion is obvious to their family. They're self-controlled. They're not driven by passions. They're pure. Pure refers to this idea of holiness or being set apart and having the right thoughts and motives and deeds. Working at home refers to this idea of keeping the home, creating a hospitable hospitable and loving environment for their family. They're kind instead of mean. 
and they're submissive to their husbands. Younger men, it's interesting. They're only given one instruction. It's like, hey, we know you can only handle one. <laughs> so just try this one out. Self-control. Just come on, try it. Right again, self-control is that not being driven by passion. And self-control is interesting because it doesn't always mean withholding something. So it's not always just like pushing back on these appetites or these desires or these passions. But sometimes self-control is willing to do the thing you ought to do when your flesh wants to kind of come back from it and, and kind of um, recoil from an opportunity. So when you see something that you ought to do, get engaged in, or inject yourself into a situation in order to seek justice, kindness, mercy. Self-control would be when you have that, that instinct to recoil from it, you actually engage and have courage. That can also be self-control. So it's not just the pushing back of the desires and the appetites and the passions, but it also is to engage. And it's anytime you're denying your fleshly impulse and pursuing what is righteous. That's self-control. So younger men are to be self-controlled. And here's an interesting piece where Titus, it, it, Paul is now talking to Titus. He's, he's been going along the way, telling him, this is what you're gonna teach to these different groups. And then he says in verse seven, after telling the young men, urging them to be self-controlled, he says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech. So there's this indication that Titus would have been considered one of those young men at that point. And that the way that he's going to teach this self-control is through urging his peers, his fellow young men, as well as modeling sound doctrine in his lifestyle. So don't just teach what they ought to do, show them day in, day out, by living according to this sound doctrine that they also must imitate. So model it. He says, be a model of good works. And then he gets to bondservant. Bondservant is an interesting term. In your translations, you may see the word slave or servant or bondservant. It, it comes from this Greek word doulos, which uh, can be translated a variety of different ways. But in the particular context, we find it here in Crete. It refers to an ancient practice and an institution that's different from the current associations that, that are often made and connected to that uh, brutal dehumanizing slavery that we understand in modern times. That's not what this is. A bond servant was actually a contractual arrangement that occurred in the Roman and Greek world that you would contract with somebody to serve a master for a period of either seven or 14 years. And as you serve them for that time period, they kept your wages earned during that time period. And then upon the completion of the contracted time, you were given your wages and you were released from contract and freed at that point. And that's the practice that's, that's referenced here particularly, according to most scholars. So bond servants here are called to be submissive to their own masters. That means that they're obedient. They're doing what their masters say for them to do. And the way that they do it, they're well-pleasing. That means they're committed to doing a good job when they're asked to do something, satisfying their masters, not doing to the bare minimum, not cutting the corners, but they're obedient. And what they do is going to be done well. Also, their attitude about doing it. They're not argumentative. In fact, they're characterized by a good attitude. They're not pilfering. This is interesting. I had to look it up. I don't use that word very often. But here's what I understand pilfering to be. Imagine you're, you're staying at a hotel and you've paid for the room, okay? And so you're in the hotel and they always have the little lotion, shampoo, conditioner, uh, hair, uh, what's that thing called? The the shower cap, there you go, and the shoe shine cloth. I've never used one of those, so. But let's say you, you got all that stuff and you're like, I paid for this place, and you grab a couple of the extra bars of soap and you put it all in your thing. That's not pilfering, because you paid for the room, right? 
What's pilfering is when you exit the room and you pass by the cart that's restocking the other rooms and you're like, oh, more free shampoo. And you grab more shampoo and shower caps, whatever, okay. And you leave with it. That's pilfering. That's stealing. It's, it's just shaving off a little bit because maybe you rationalize, oh, they have enough. They, they can do without or they have plenty of resources or they, it's, it's intended to be taken or whatever you rationalize. It's not honest. And you're ultimately taking what's not yours. So it's, it's called stealing. <laughs> so bond servants are not to pilfer for whatever reason. And so they are characterized by honesty and not stealing. And then the last one, showing all good faith, meaning they are demonstrated as being someone who is trusted and can be trusted. This is the character of the bond servant. And so why do you think, I mean, these are, these are obviously applicable to us, but before we jump there, we have to understand why these particular things are kind of teased out of what is sound doctrine, because sound doctrine includes a lot more than this. So why these particular things is it that Titus is supposed to teach? Well, you start to consider the local context of Crete at that time. So Crete was a, uh, an island, and in the mythology of the Cretans, they believed that that is the place where Zeus died. And so the cult of Zeus, or the, the kind of epicenter of Zeus worship, the Greek mythological god, Zeus, was primarily done there on the island of Crete. And you will inevitably become like what you worship. That is a fact. And the Cretans, they worship Zeus. Well, in their mindset, whatever Zeus did or however Zeus was, that would have been considered virtuous. Well, Zeus's reputation, especially among the Cretans, was two things primarily. He was known as a womanizer, and he was also known to be incredibly deceptive and a liar. So imagine a culture where infidelity and deception are not vices, but are virtues. A culture shaped by deception and unfaithfulness. Those are the prized attitudes and characteristics especially that men should pursue. Imagine a culture like that. It's not hard to imagine. And so the Cretans were shaped by their worship of Zeus and those characteristics of Zeus. So when you then reread this list, it's very interesting to see why self-control Faithfulness to one's family, not being a thief, a liar. Why that, where a community that's shaped by those truths would be distinct. Specifically self-control, not driven by passions because if, if passion is the reason why you can kind of rationalize anything, well, then everything's on the table because then I can just go with what, what I desire, how, I, how I'm made. Is that not unlike our culture today? Be true to who you are? Huh. So we look at this and we see why Paul might instruct Titus specifically in these areas of doctrine, doctrine that emanates from the true confession that Jesus is the son of God. He is the Messiah. And because of that, there's a culture that's shaped by that allegiance, that worship. There are moralities, there are ethical standards that Jesus now holds and has demonstrated that his followers, his disciples, are to also emulate. And if they do that, they will be noticeably different from the culture around them. They'll be distinct. They'll be the called out ones, the church, which is what they were intended to be. And so I think it's important that 
when we look at a passage like this, it's easy to go, well, that was then. And so there's some things here that, well, that's antiquated or old or whatever. But the most important thing we need to do is ask, what is our cult of Zeus today? The culture around us, what are they worshiping and how does that shape their morality? And how is it that we are gonna be tempted to homogenize with that culture rather than remain distinct from it? What are the virtues that they're hailing and exalting that are actually vices according to the word of God? That's the question. That's what we have to wrestle with. And it's, it's easy to sometimes say, well, it's the really obvious things. But sometimes, it, and it's, all, well, it's often easy to point it out in other people. That's the easy thing, is we can look at others and go, man, they're way off track. They've drifted. But the better thing is to take inventory of your own allegiances, your own worship, your own aspects of having drifted from fidelity to the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. There's a, right now I would say, one of the greatest challenges to the church in America would be something that is considered to be a counterfeit Christianity. There's a, a worldview that was kind of articulated a few years ago. And then recently, uh, the Barna Group put out a survey or a uh, big study that showed the dominant worldview in the United States today held by adults. And interestingly enough, it was the dominant worldview held by teenagers 25 years ago. Well, guess what? We grew up. And we still hold to these things by and large. And so this worldview is described as moralistic therapeutic deism. That's a mouthful, I know. But basically, the belief system, it articulates a few things that kind of characterize it. First of all, it's a belief in a God who remains distant from people's lives would be the generalized view. People uh, are supposed to be good to each other I get generally accepted, which we're like, okay. The universal purpose of life is to ultimately be happy and feel good about oneself. Does that sound biblical? Well, if the Bible says that we're all sinners, born into sin, completely, utterly sinful until Jesus comes in the picture, that probably doesn't build up self-esteem very well. They also believe that there are no absolute moral truths and that truth is really something to be discovered and experienced and determined by someone's own person. That's not biblical. Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's very exclusive. How about they believe that God allows good people into heaven? that if you're just kind of generally considered good and decent person, you'll get into heaven. Is that biblical? No. It says that we're all wretched sinners, saved by grace through faith, not of our own doing. It has nothing to do with our goodness. It has everything to do with the blood of Jesus. That God places very limited demands on his people. That he doesn't really expect us to do a whole lot or to live a certain way. Is that biblical? I mean, we just read chapter two of Titus says that there are particular ways in which we're expected to live if we claim to follow Jesus. So that's not biblical. Well, the, the, the disturbing thing about this survey was that 74% of those that claim this or are described by this also claim to be Christians. So the majority of those that adhere to this moralistic therapeutic deism are also going around wearing the name of Christ. They're also adhering to 
uh, certain other beliefs. 74% of them believe in karma. 75% of them don't believe that God is the basis of all truth. What? 71% do not believe that the Bible is the true and reliable communication from God. That's a non-starter. You say you're a Christian, but this is not inspired by God. Then what are you basing your Christianity on? What is it based on? So when we look around, we can definitely identify out there ways in which people are in, indistinct from the culture, but we have to take inventory here first. And we have to be really honest with ourselves. Are there ways that I have compromised or ways that I am drifting and I look more like the culture and I'm non-distinct and that God is convicting me about things in my life, dispositions, opinions, activities that are not aligned with Christ. And you need to respond to it. We need to respond to it. So first we have to recognize something about this community that Titus is called to teach to and that we ourselves I've also experienced, and that is the reason why Paul can tell Titus to teach these things is because they, first of all, have new life. By confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, they've experienced new life, which means sin has been dealt with. And sin has been dealt with in two primary ways. The first way, sin is what causes us to be guilty before God. It's what causes guilt. So you have violated the laws of God and stand guilty before him. So Jesus comes in and deals with our guilt issue. He takes all of that wrath and all of that punishment that's due us and he takes it and he absorbs it. And he says, now you're clear. You're justified. No more condemnation. The other thing that Jesus does is he deals with the pollution that comes with sin. Because sin not only causes us to be guilty, but it causes us to be polluted. Our minds, our hearts, our wills are all toxic and poisoned by this thing called sin. And so we don't have right motives, the right reasons. We may do good things, but the reason we do them, there's always that little strain of, of poison in it from sin. And so what Jesus comes in is he comes in and he gives a new heart. That heart of stone is being transitioned to a heart of flesh. His spirit comes and dwells within us. And we now have the ability to then do things for him that are considered righteous before God. Because of the new life, we have been washed by the blood of Christ. And now we can walk in newness of life. And that as we do that and walk in obedience, we experience sanctification that we become more and more pure in our motives and the pollution becomes less and less as we walk in obedience to him. So the first thing that these Christians on the island of Crete and these Christians at East Haven Baptist Church in the Flathead Valley, we have new life. The old is past, the new has come. We have new life. So we're no longer bound by the false worship, the idolatry and the sin that we were born into and that completely saturates the culture around us. We're no longer bound to it. We've been given new life, which means we can develop and are becoming a new culture. Culture is the combination of what you believe and how you behave We've been given radically transformed new beliefs and understanding about the nature of reality, about God, about ourselves, and about the world around us. And so to go along with that, we now behave according to those beliefs and that new understanding. If we don't, then we're just like the people that Paul talked about earlier. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. And that's a toxic culture. To claim one thing and act another way, that's toxicity. That's poison. But we're called to, based on this belief, this confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we act in line with that confession. Now, we're not perfect. And so we repent, but we trust by faith that as we continue, led by God and his word, we can then walk in faithful obedience to Christ. And that's going to produce a particular culture 
And imagine a, a world that looks on and sees that kind of culture. In fact, if you look at the text, notice the so that's, the so that's that occur. Right? He's, he's going through this teaching and he's talking to these different groups. And when he gets to verse five, he says, you know, the younger women are to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled or so that the word of God may not be reviled. So one, you behave this way so no one can say that the teaching is somehow wrong, empty, or false. Then again, in verse eight, and sound, so he's telling Titus to exercise sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. So Titus, you're supposed to teach and do consistently with what you're teaching so that the world can't condemn you or the teaching or say anything evil about us. And the third one, verse 10, not pilfering, this is about bond servants, not, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. That's an interesting one. Adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. To adorn. How do we normally use that? It means to, to dress up, to fix up, to draw attention to something. And so we, in the way that we live, we, not just as individuals, but we, as the church, as we live according to this kind of doctrine, it will cause those outside of the church to be attracted to these teachings that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's not that we're not going to have conflict in the church, but it's the way that we deal with our conflict. It's not that we're not going to have sin, but it's how we respond. It's how we treat each other. It's how we sacrifice for one another. It's how we die to self. It's how we use our gifts to serve and to give of ourselves so that others may be built up. It is this kind of behavior, living according to this kind of doctrine because of this kind of God that will cause the world to be attracted. It will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Our behavior is what adorns it. And so are we exercising a life together as a community? Are we living in such a way that would cause others outside of our body to be attracted? Or do we look too much like the world and we aren't distinct enough to where they're like, ah, I don't want to be a part of that. That's what we have to wrestle with today. Well, It's not done in our own strength, praise be to God. Because another thing that happens is we're provided a new power. Jesus himself says in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And he's referencing you in the plural, that the spirit of God lives in us, animates us for those who have truly confessed and have been transformed by Christ and have his spirit dwelling in you. You will experience distinction. You will experience friction from the world because you will act and live in a way that draws attention. You're no longer allowed to blend in, but you're distinct. And so if you don't feel that opposition, if you don't feel the tension of others looking at you and wondering why you do it the way you do it, then maybe you're not distinct enough. And that relates directly to what you believe about Jesus Christ. And if you truly, truly believe it. The reality is, is it's tempting and easy to drift. Because if we're dwelt by his spirit, Paul tells us in Romans 12, one through two, 
our spiritual act of worship, right, is this, this sacrifice. We're to give up our lives. But he says something very interesting, that we are to no longer be conformed, but rather be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can discern the will of God and do every good work prepared. The point there is, he says that you're either going to be conformed or you're going to be transformed. He doesn't say don't conform it, but rather transform. That would be us as the actors, that we're responsible to either conform or transform. But he says, don't be conformed, which means it's something outside of us that would cause us to conform. Or it's something outside of us that would cause this transformation to occur. And so our responsibility in this is, how are you posturing yourself? What are you opening yourself up to? What kind of influences are you giving yourself to? Are you giving yourself to influences that will conform you to the world so that you're indistinct? Or are you posturing yourself for transformation by the Spirit of God through the Word of God and the fellowship of God's people? It's either conformity or transformity. Reality is you're going to be shaped by something. And it's far too easy to drift, to think that we're, we're doing great and we don't realize how far we've actually drifted from our first love, Jesus Christ. It reminds me, we moved back here from Texas. And before we moved here, we got our last little bit of the ocean. And we went to the Gulf Coast and we were playing in the ocean, my kids and I. And one of the ways that we like to play is we like to battle the waves. Okay, we're standing in the, the, the beach and the waves are coming in. And as they come in, we like kick them, we give them the old atomic elbow from the ropes or we, you know, body slam them, but we fight the waves. And as you start to get out a little bit further, the waves, you know, the water's deeper and you can kind of feel the wave rather than the wave crashing on you. And you, kind of, you can kind of ride it. And it's just so powerful. And so it's fun to kind of just, as the wave comes in, to jump so that your head stays above water and then you come back down. And then you jump and your head comes above water and you jump. And so we're doing this and we did this for quite some time. About, a, I don't know, 30 minutes goes by and I turn to say, okay, I'm gonna head back to the beach and, and find our chairs with the towels. And I turn around and I see not my stuff. I look way, way down and it, I mean, it is way down there. And in just 30 minutes, like, I'm like, what? Well, I realized what was happening, right? That as, as the waves come in and I'm playing, although I feel like when I jump and I come back down that I'm landing in the same sand, I'm not. Every time I jump, I drift before I touch down again. Every time my feet leave the ground, the tide pulls me just a little bit. Although I don't detect it, I don't feel it. So anytime I leave the firm footing of the ground, I automatically drift with the tide. We as believers have to stay firmly footed in the word of God and the truth of God, or we will drift. Not if, we will. If we, we just, just come off, off of that truth and that firm foundation just a little bit, culture will drift us. And then we'll start to look at the Bible and start to go, well, I need to kind of cut the rough edges off because that doesn't really align with what I really think should be the case. And so then we start to shift our understanding or just take bits and pieces of God's word. And then we continue to drift as we jump and drift, jump and drift. We have to take the whole counsel of God's word. And we need to be transformed by him so that we remain a distinct people. And so let us proceed from a passage like this, taking a little bit of inventory of our lives. Are we distinct from those that we know that don't know Jesus? And are we distinct in a way and dealing with one another in a way that would cause them to be attracted to the one and only Jesus Christ? Those are the questions we must wrestle with today. Amen? Let us pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for, so much for the time that we got to spend this morning. I pray that you would lead us and guide us by your word as your people. And that you, Father, would remind us 
of our one true love and reveal any ways in us, in our hearts, in our activities, in our opinions, in our words that don't align with your truth. Please, we ask that you would be faithful by your spirit to convict us. And I pray for anyone who is gathered here today that is deciding to make that confession that Jesus is the Christ. I pray that that you would come into their life, you would come to their heart and do a mighty work to cause them to be distinct from the life they led before. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.